Welcome back everyone. Today we're going to be discussing a very highly requested topic. That is the max pain theory, but it's going to be a little bit different from most of the videos that you've seen. Why is that? Well, most of the explanations I've seen simply describe what the max pain theory is and make a lot of assumptions without digging into it or analyzing it from the vantage point of an institution, which strikes me as a little bit strange because the entire theory is based on institutional activity and yet nobody can look at it or truly explain it from the eyes or the lens of an institution. Now, as you know, my name is Peter Tarr and I've spent time working for institutions. In fact, I became a licensed options and derivatives specialist as well as a stock trader back in 2005 and have been involved with capital markets ever since. I manage my own private equity fund. And of course, you can find me on Twitter at Profits Taken. So let's get right into talking about this and explore the max pain theory. Let's see if it makes sense, where it's legitimate, where it's valid, where it isn't, perhaps both. Let's really dig in and get a comprehensive view of it. That way you can understand whether this is a viable theory to apply to your trading and stocks and or options. So let's dig right in. What's the first step? Well, the first step is to discuss what the max pain theory is. And I'm gonna give you a general breakdown. The idea with max pain theory, and I've taken this directly from Investopedia, which I think is great for just getting basic definitions. And the general idea is that the option strike price with the most contracts and thus the price that causes the financial losses for the largest number of options holders at expirations will be sought by institutions. So what does that mean in plain English? It's important to really get the definition clear. Well, the idea is that if we have a set price, let's say a stock is trading at $10 and you have all sorts of calls that have been purchased in the most open interest, the biggest amount of money for options holders is if it, this contract expires in the money and beyond, let's say $9. Let's say that's where the most interest is. So what will happen according to Max Payne theory is market makers, institutions, will push the price down artificially. That way they leave these option holders out of the money, letting their contracts expire worthless. Why does that make any sense? Why would that, at least at face value, make sense and be viable? Well, how do options writers make money? The assumption here is that the people writing the options tend to be institutions. Okay. How do they make money? How do you make money when you write an option? Well, what you're hoping and looking for is the option to expire worthless, right? Out of the money, because then you collect the premium that someone paid. That's the amount that you pay for a contract. So when you're buying an options contract, that's your premium. If it expires at zero, somebody collected your premium. Let's say you paid 50 cents a contract, right? That's $50 per contract. Since we multiply it by 100, of course, for those of you who don't know. Okay, well, if it expires at zero, that person just got your $50 and they give you nothing, right? So the idea is that the more this happens, those options writers, institutions in this case, will collect premium and make money. And since you get big volume on a lot of large cap stocks and various stocks, there's a lot of money involved. But let's take a look and see if that makes sense. So I'm just going to give you an idea by taking a look at a different screenshot here. We're going to move on and we're going to take a look at Meta. And as you can see, just to get a general idea, in order to properly execute on the max pain theory, and I know there's a lot of calculators out there, you'd have to take a look and see whether there's the most open interest. Where would you cause the maximum amount of pain, thus the name, if you were to push the price? So here with Meta, let's say that we were going long, right? So if we were trying to crush people who are holding options, we would want to, and we assume that the most options holding and the biggest amount of pain would be at 135. Let's say we were at 134, as you could see here, that was the close. You would try to push the price down, make sure that it's under 135. So in this case, this would cause a lot of pain. If, if we expired at 134, this was a Friday, right? And that's important because that's gonna be a big part of this explanation. If this were a Friday and we closed at 134, Everything you see above here, everything you see is going to end up worthless. All this action, these thousands of contracts, uh, 135, 36, 37, you can just count up how much money that's worth. They would get crushed because it would go to zero because they would have no intrinsic value, right? And their extrinsic value would expire. 
In short, if you don't understand the extrinsic instrins, intrinsic, don't worry about it. it. Just means it expire at zero, and then it would be worthless. And so, all the institutions would collect these premiums. That means for everybody who paid that 320 or 271 or 231 that you're looking at, that goes to the institutions. You get zero. Now, that kind of makes sense, right? Because institutions want to make money. Well, let's start to take a look and go deeper. And one thing I want to note is part of the popularity for any theory comes from the idea that people explain it without digging in on both sides. That's why I wanted to add my professional lens to this. People love to explain things that are super simple and oversimplify the markets as though if you just memorize this and just use this one formula and one technique, you'll make a bunch of money right? You'll get rich. All you got to do is follow Max Payne or the calls and puts here or this key level or that key level. There's no simple formula that is a magic bullet to make you money. This is a multi-trillion dollar industry. Anything you know, institutions know. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later because institutions go deeper than you think. They're also on Twitter and they're watching. So let's take a look at a chart here because I think the best and easiest example is to use a chart of some actual price action and then explain what max pain would entail. Right. So here we have in front of you the chart for Meta, right? Formerly Facebook. And you can see I have a lot of different lines here and I set that up so that everybody could just get a look at this and understand it a little bit more easily. So we make this assumption and always watch out for con artists or scammers. And I'm gonna stop really quickly and say people I consider to be con artists and scammers are also people who just fake it and they like to talk the talk but don't really know what they're talking about. The moment you dig in and get technical, everything collapses, but they'll regurgitate something like, oh, this is the way it works, bro, it's so simple. Nothing's that simple, otherwise everybody would be rich, right? If it's just simple, memorize a formula, they don't go any deeper. And I wanna take a look at this theory because if you don't look at the nuts and bolts to see whether it's actually feasible from a cost standpoint, then none of it makes sense. You can't just take an assumption at face value and go, yeah, those institutions just tank the price like it's nothing. They push a magic button and the price goes down and then, you know, options expire worthless. Well, not quite. So take a look at Meta here. We're going to start on this past Friday and I'm just going from one closing day to the next and I didn't do anything too special. I was recording this and I'm finishing this up on October 17th. That's right over here. And I'm taking a look at the last trading day before, that was the weekend, October 14th. So it's not like I had to find any magic special days with perfect price action to make this easier. In fact, I like just grabbing something random. That is a trade that I called out today. So we take a look here. And let's say that we want to close at a certain price, right? And of course, that's what institutions are gunning for. They want to see things close at a specific price. Why does it matter to close? Well, you want to see close and this particularly happens on at the end of the week because this is when expiration happens. This is when contracts can go worthless. The only time a contract can truly become worthless is as it expires. So that's why using a Friday makes perfect sense to explain this theory. Okay, so the idea is that the heaviest action will likely be, and this is just making the assumption because price action can happen all throughout the week but it's most likely to be heaviest at the end of the week, right? Because we could see Meta was in a very different place. And the more distance you have to cover in terms of price, the more of a price change you have to affect, the more intense this is for an institution. But let's make some assumptions and break this down in a simple way. And for those of you who don't like looking at numbers, you shouldn't be trading this kind of theory. If you can't follow what I'm about to explain or dig in yourself, don't trade a theory. Don't trade it anything that you can't understand. Never take the approach of like, ah, oh, someone made it easy and now you're complicating this. I don't want to know this. That's like covering your ears and saying, I want to gamble with my money because I have this hope of getting rich off this theory. And you don't want to hear otherwise. If you're in the markets, be in the markets, protect your capital and try to make money, right? I teach people, be patient. Don't throw your money around. This isn't a casino. You worked hard for it. Remember how hard you, you worked for your money before you throw it around. So let's get into some numbers here. So let's assume that we're getting into power hour, right? We're about an hour and a half before a close. And in order to cause the max amount of pain, let's assume we don't have to go very far. And I'm making this really simple and erring on the side of a max pain theory where it could be easily executed based on the theory. We don't have to go far, right? Because if we started at one, I don't know, 34, it'll be quite a distance and institutions would have to 
pound a lot of volume to drag the price down. It go very far, right? But the assumption is that as we get closer to close, here we are, we're not too far away, we're, we're just a point away from putting people out of the money. Let's say one break under 127 puts everybody out of the money. So this is where we're trying to get to. Well, how do institutions move the price down? How do market makers do that? It's not just pushing a button and typing in manually saying, make price 127, yay, took money from retail traders. That's nonsense. And again, that's how people oversimplify it. The only way to bring the cost down is to push through selling pressure. What is selling pressure here? Well, they're going to have to either sell some of their existing inventory of Meta or take a short position, right? So let's assume that you're coming in and taking a short position because the idea of just selling off your inventory for no other reason than for this max pain doesn't make as much sense, but you could work with that if you really want to. So let's say that you shorted, right? You can go either way. We need some kind of selling pressure, either selling what you have or shorting the stock. So you start shorting from here and you push enough pressure in this last bit so that it closes where you want. Remember, you don't want to shoot this around here. You don't want to spend this capital earlier in the day because price can rebound, right? You can have a rebound. You could even be forced to cover and then there's a squeeze up. So you start short selling about an hour and a half before. Here's the price. And again, I'm not pulling us from here. I'm not going from the highest point of the day. This is a really narrow point because I really want to underscore the entire explanation behind my thoughts on this theory. So you start moving down from 127.80, let's say. I've got it over here, starting price 79, right? And we move down to 126.86. That's the approximate close, right? I'm just making this really simple. You know, if you look at the lows, actually 126.52. So we don't even affect an entire dollar here, right? We actually just have a 93 cent move. Well, is it that simple as just to say, whoa, it's 93 cents, an institution could just push a button and market makers drop the price? No, the only way price moves is through transactions. So you need heavier selling pressure, right? This is selling pressure where a seller is taking the bid, taking the bid, taking the bid, pushing the price down. Because remember, it's not a matter of having sellers and buyers, like where a red candle means there were sellers or more sellers and a green candle means there were more buyers. That makes no sense. The only way for a stock to exchange hands is to have both a seller and a, and a buyer. Otherwise, there's no volume. A transaction means there was a seller and there was a buyer. For everything sold, somebody bought. The way that we get down to pressure is when you're hitting the bid, when you're an aggressive seller. So sellers were more aggressive here. They were pushing down, they were taking the bid more frequently taking prices lower than the ask, bringing the cost down. If we're moving up, that means you're hitting higher prices, higher and higher prices, pushing the price up. So we know that we have to sell to bring the price down. Okay, easy enough, right? Well, no, that's not free. How many shares traded here, right? If we look and we add up the volume, the volume's up here, right? One of the problems here is that the heaviest period in volume on the day is towards the end of the day and the morning. The opening tends to have the highest volume. Second highest period is the close. That's why many people call it the power hour. So let's look at how many shares traded here because this is important. There are 587. You know, if we move up here, you can see the volume. 587,000 in this period, 903,000, 2.346 million, right? And that brings us to close. And so if you add that all up and you're following, that brings us to just over 3.8 million shares traded, right? That's this period of time here where supposedly, we're exploring this, market makers are bringing the price down by shorting or selling inventory in order to get to a point of max pain. 3.8 million shares traded. Well, what is that in terms of dollars? If we assume the average cost is $127.3, right? Let's say they were shorting from here to here. If we took all of the transactions that occurred in that period of time and just put it at an average of 127.3, that's $127.3 times 3.8 million. We come up to $488.5 million, just shy of a half billion dollars. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that a market maker would have to transact all of those shares. That doesn't make any sense. There are other people involved. There are other institutions. There are other retail traders. A lot of people are trading. But in order to do what we say is happening in Max Payne, they have to trade a sufficient amount of shares to shake the price and bring it down. And that's where there's no perfect formula, 
but you assume it's a significant portion because they don't want to simply participate and trade at what the prevailing rate is. They want to take control of the market and move the price in their direction. That means the pressure applied by the institution has to be strong enough so they can certainly impact the price in their direction. And they can't go too softly here. They have to be monitoring, looking at feedback and looking at the direction of price. Because if they engage in this, and let's just say there was 488 million uh, in revenue exchanged, let's just say they hit that volume and they only put in $5 million and they didn't get what they wanted, then they don't get the max pain, they don't get to collect the full amount, and they have to suffer the other consequences. So out of 488 million, if we assumed 10 to 20%, that 10 to 20% of this volume in order to impact this great a change, right? And again, I'm using a really, really soft example here. We're only going down like 93 cents, right? But let's say they pushed down 93 cents. Let's say they accounted for 10 to 20% of the volume in that time. 10% of 488 million would be 48 million. 20% would be 96. Let's say we go somewhere in the middle at an exposure of $75 million, right? So what do I mean by exposure? Well, this is the next part of the conversation that's really big. We assume this happened, right? Everything makes sense. They caused max pain. It was that easy. They just put a bunch of money in. They put in about $70, $75 million in terms of shorting or in selling off their own inventory to push pressure down, right? And the assumption here is we're going to say that they're shorting because they're taking an action to shoot price down. The specific reason is the max pain, not simply this is their holding and they were just trying to sell meta anyhow. This is part of their max pain move in this theory. So they're exposed to $75 million or said differently, they took a $75 million short where they pushed down the market price and they'll buy it back after they cause max pain. So hold on. Here's something that you need to understand about institutions. I've worked in institutions or for TD also, the software that I'm using for this explanation in the chart is Thinkorswim, which is owned by TD, also known they have branches called TD Waterhouse, etc. Here's what happens. So now they're exposed. And one of the number one things institutions do is they mitigate risk and they calculate risk. In fact, I run the insiders program where people learn from me privately, follow some of my trades. In my fund, I've said this many times. I'm not a stock trader. I'm not a stock analyst first. I'm not a market expert first. I'm a risk management specialist. Yes, my title is private equity fund manager. My title has been stock trader, investor, a lot of things. I calculate risk. There are entire departments, whether it's Goldman Sachs, whether it's any of the big funds, any institution is constantly calculating something called exposure. What is your risk exposure? I'm looking for high upside, low downside, and I'm always trying to mitigate my risk so as not to get torched, destroyed, burned, sold off, whatever you want to say, crushed. Risk exposure is key, and there are professionals whose sole job at institutions, you can go look this up and look for job openings, is a risk mitigation specialist. And you might see risk credit analyst, risk specialist, risk analyst, etc. This is what an analyst does. You have to constantly be weighing the upside and the downside. So in this case, we would call that $75 million taken into close on the sell-off exposure. Why? You are now exposed to $75 million short. And here's where it gets less sweet. You also, when you're shorting, it's easier if we were doing this on, we were looking at calls or pushing the price up, but I'm gonna explain both ways. When you're buying, you're exposed only to the position that you're holding. When you're shorting, you're also carrying the borrowing costs, right? Now, if you're trying to get out of your position the next day or two, your borrowing costs aren't gonna be that great because you know it's calculated on a rate where a day or two won't be that much. But again, there's a super high amount of volume here. We're in at $75 million and you're car carrying the borrowing costs overnight. What else is your exposure? And let me remind you, institutions do not like the volatility of exposure. How do I say that a different way so everyone understands? Institutions aren't your bro on Twitter saying, oh, YOLO puts on this, lottery play on that. That's not the way you manage multi-billion dollar funds. That's crazy talk. They don't like risk. They don't play casino. They play it so that they win. They're there to make money. They don't go for quote unquote 10 bangers. Okay, you're using billions of dollars. If you get a one, three, five, seven, nine percent return in a short period of time, that's phenomenal. If you look annually and you hear of a fund that hits 15% annually, this is a holy grail fund. Everybody would be dumping their money in that. Most wealthy clients and people I've worked with, if you told them, hey, I'll guarantee you 15% 
15, 16, 14% a year, they'll say, I will walk away right now. Give me 15 plus percent per year. So that you understand, I need to underscore, they don't play high risk games because it's too expensive. They don't like the risk. They can make money better ways. The house doesn't like to lose, in other words. So here we are exposed with an average buy-in of 127.3 based on this theory. And this is just a simple example where, again, I didn't talk about a big move down, right? If I talked about shorting from 131 all the way down, you'd be very exposed, right? Because you were shorting here. You need the price to stay where it is. Well, let's take a look and see what happens here, okay? We go overnight, what happens? Well, you have to buy back. And if it was an institution that bought shares, right? I'm just talking about short position. They'd have to sell because again, the whole max pain theory is that they only did this. Market makers simply either bought shares or sold off to hit a specific price so that they can cause the max pain. And then of course they want to get out. This isn't a long-term position. So now I'm going to be super generous again and assume that they have this overnight gap. And remember, they don't like this. I don't like this. I talk to this about my insiders all the time. I talk to this, talk to people on Twitter about this frequently is that overnight is a risk because there are gap ups and gap downs, particularly in this market. If you guys have been watching lately and it's in 2022, high volatility, we see big gaps all the time. And this isn't one of the really big ones. But what happens? Well, we open at 130.18. Now, I'm going to be really generous. Typically, a short position takes a day or so to sell off because it's not like you can just dump a ton of shares, just like you would take a little bit longer to get in. But let's assume we keep it apples to apples. And let's say that we can get out in an hour and a half, just the way we got into our position in an hour and a half, right? Here's where, let's say that this is where we open and this is where you begin to buy back, right? Why are you buying back? Because if you shorted to bring the price down, you're now buying to cover. That's called short covering, right? And you can cause a squeeze. And let's say that they're managing to do this very aggressively. Again, I'm being very generous here. Let's say that they're able to squeeze in in an hour and a half. And let's say they got out in the same amount of time because I want it apples to apples to be fair. And let's say that their average buyback price, even though it'll probably be higher, I'm gonna be generous again and say that it's 131.15, right? So you got out at 131.15. What was your average cost? Your average cost, your short was at 127.30. So where does that put you? $3.85 out of pocket, right? That means you lost. How did you lose? Well, you were exposed to this, right? You shorted, you short, that means you want the price to go down because you're gonna have to buy those stocks back. So you got $127.30 on your average short position when you sold that off. And then when you bought it back, you bought for $131.15. So you're out $3.15. Now, we know that there were 3.8 million shares transacted, right? So if we calculated, just, and I'm gonna show you guys the calculation here. Now let's bring in our calculator and see how much that costs. And again, guys, be patient. If you wanna trade, you have to understand things. You can't just trade blindly. So we know that there was 3.837 million shares sold, right? This was our number, 3837984. And you can work on your calculator as well. I'm gonna show you the calculation. And we assume that they accounted for 15% of that trading volume, right? Because it wasn't all the trading volume, but we say about 10 to 20%. That's 575,697.6 shares, right? Okay, well, what did we look at? If we assume an average cost of 127.3 with a buyback of 131.15, that's a loss of $3.85 per share. So we go over here and we multiply this number by 3.85. That's the amount that the institution would have lost covering this trade. So now we have an ugly calculation, right? And it could have been a lot worse because there was buying pressure for Facebook. This could have gone up and up and up and up. But with very generous calculations, just on the overnight gap on that position, if they took a short position and they were able to cover, and again, I was being generous, I assumed the covering uh, period was the same period, hour and a half, as the sell-off and that they didn't create any more pressure or have to deal with higher prices and give a very generous amount here. Your generation, your loss here is $2.2 million. Now, what you might be saying is, yeah, but they could have made more of that, more than that off of the max pain because they could have caused a lot more pain. So that 
That requires that a single institution will have a larger position than this. But the number one thing here is that it's risk. That's a tremendous amount of risk exposure you're gambling because they can't cover that position overnight. This could have gapped up a lot higher. And remember, when you're dealing with 575,000 shares, every dollar that we move up is devastating, right? Because that's per share. So you go up $2, every $2 is over a million dollars in losses. So you take a big, big loss here. What if we open up four or five points up? That's a big loss. That erodes everything that you picked up from the max pain potentially. And keep in mind, when you look at something, we're gonna pull this back up here. I'm gonna pull up Meta. Here's a look at Meta, right? There's a lot of action on both sides. So it's not as though institutions are only covering one side where they can cause the max pain. Well, yeah, as you put something in a lower price, right? That favors the puts. So then you have a battle between the calls and the puts. And of course you can calculate that and see which side it's tilted to, but you're starting to understand more and more that this becomes much more dangerous. And again, if you want to find a way, this is a problem that some traders have. If you calculated everything perfectly and looked in hindsight and found the specific perfect example and was, were able to trace back who held what position, you could probably find some examples and say, ha, somebody made money there. Okay, I can give you an example of someone flipping a coin and making a lot of money. It doesn't mean it's a good theory. Why would flipping a coin work? Why is that not simply facetious? Well, because stocks will go up or down, right? There's only one of two ways you can go. Yeah, you probably can close even, but 99.9% .9 of the time, a stock does not, at least not a large cap, does not close exactly even. So you flip a coin, you might go up, you might go down. It's only going to go one way. So the idea here is there's a tremendous amount of exposure, a lot of variables, and a lot of variability that cannot be controlled by institutions, even if they have specific exposure to one side. So it goes from being this total silver bullet, awesome theory, follow the max pain indicators, oh, that's where it's going to go to. No, it's not, because again, there's pain on both sides. And no matter what, if you're pushing this into close when something's going to expire at zero, that means you have to hold weekend volatility. You have to hold through these gaps, right? Because you just picked up those shares or you sold off short positions. Short position, you're also carrying the cost of borrowing, right? Because you're in a short position. And now you're exposed to all of this volatility. And you have to calculate that against potential money that you might make. But remember, you can't only expose yourself to one side. So when we look at this, people start assuming that, well, all the calls were written by one institution. No, that's also not how that works. There's institutions on both sides. When you look at something like this, there are market makers and institutions potentially on both sides or retail traders, all kinds of people. So who's to say that one institution, right? If you're looking at the volume here, doesn't have a competing interest with another institution. So how much more volume needs to be transacted for one to counterbalance the other? And you start getting really deep into this twisted idea. Now, why wasn't this explained by most people? Well, because you can't sell, you can't get clicks, likes, or followers or Discord subscribers or whatever it is if something's complicated and it's not something that excites people. What's the kind of thing that excites someone? If I say, hey, I could show you this simple theory that will get you a 15% return per week. Everybody's gonna say, oh my God, I wanna click. Let me put my money in because you wanna have that hope, that dream that it's all this easy. And remember, another thing here, institutions are watching. So they're also watching and monitoring the idea that retail traders might be using the max pain theory. So it's almost counterintuitive and paradoxical because if you're suggesting that institutions are watching to cause retail traders pain, but they're also watching retail traders follow the max pain, then you could say they wouldn't want to do max pain because it would benefit retail traders. And it starts to get sillier and sillier and sillier, right? But the overall issue is it comes down to numbers, right? And I could tell you this firsthand. Retail, uh, sorry, institutions have admitted they do follow and they scan Twitter. They've said that they spend resources on doing exactly that. So this theory falls apart for a plethora of reasons, but the number one reason is just exposure. You're constantly exposed. There's competing interests. There's both sides. There's the calls and the puts. Even the max pain calculators, they're not showing you who's exposed to which side. So you don't know where there's competing interest between institutions, and it gets all fuddled up. So. Could you paint a situation where you could say, oh yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, that's what the hucksters and the con artists do. They want to oversimplify it so that you buy in and say, hey, I'll use this. And sometimes it might work, just like flipping a coin will. Sometimes it won't. But what I do is I like to separate theories 
and data, even indicators, all sorts of data into two categories. There's one category where it's a signal. A signal is something that I can use to make a trade, right? If Meta downgrades their forecast for the future, I know that that's probably something that's going to apply a lot of negative pressure because the reason that people trade in the first place is to get a return on their investment. If they upgrade, I know that that's going to be bullish. That's a signal. Noise is something that might have some validity or might not have validity, but it's impossible to properly parse so that you can use it effectively. In the best case scenario, the average for Meta for the max pain theory ends up being noise. It ends up being noise because in order to have all the variables and to be able to predict what's going to happen in after hours is nearly impossible. So it's not something that you can properly follow for a signal. And I know that might be disappointing, but I'm not dogmatic. I'm not on team max pain. I'm not on team technical analysis, team A or team B. I have one goal is to be profitable and return an investment, uh, to have an investment return for my stakeholders. And to, of course, to explain things in a legitimate way. I know it's not as popular, it doesn't get as many clicks, people don't get pumped up and they don't say, oh, this guy's helping me learn something, but you know what? Some of the best things you can learn is what to avoid because there's a million and one different theories and following something without understanding it or following it without it working is a quick way to have a false sense of confidence. You feel good, right? And a lot of people just really wanna feel good. But if you're serious about making money, then you don't care about the emotions involved. You just want to be successful. Again, there could be some potential validity, but the ability to separate the noise from the signal is nearly impossible. And for that reason, I don't use the max pain theory. It would have to be a very acute situation where perhaps they would just have to, a market maker would just have to push it down a few cents on very little volume near the very end of the day. It might do something like that. That makes more sense. But the more that you move the price, the greater your exposure is, right? If we move this down five dollars right or if we move this down from let's say you know 130 or, or wherever it was the more you move something down the more exposure you have right so that makes it difficult like if we had to pump a lot of volume just to get that last dollar down and then it shot up and we're buying back at 132.50 so much exposure so much loss just on covering or again if it was calls and the price went down you're selling off and selling off in and of itself creates selling pressure and pushes it down. Just like in this case, as you cover, particularly if you're trying to cover really quickly in a short period of time for hundreds of thousands of shares, your covering is pushing the price up and that's pushing it in the opposite direction that you want it to go to. We call that a squeeze and everybody knows that's a real potential phenomenon, short covering squeezes. So hopefully this gives you a little bit more insight. At the end of the day, it remains more noise than signal other than really hyper acute specific instances and I hope this saves people a little bit of money. I hope this helps people understand. And to those who are hoping that there was a silver bullet they could just follow, know that trading isn't like that, but you can learn the right way. For those of you who want to learn a little bit, little bit more, learn from me directly, it's ProfitsTaken.com. Or if you just want to follow me on Twitter, please feel free to do that, ProfitsTaken on Twitter. Okay, guys, thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.